Do you want to make your home smarter? Is it worth it? Wendell Berry says that we need to evaluate a tool or any technology by what path it leads us down. He says there are two choices, they don't overlap. The one choice is to be more intensive, to be more about quality, to be more about care. The other choice is to be more extensive, to be more about quantity, to be more about speed. And I see us in choosing smart homes this question of this crossroad. We need to make smart decisions with these smart devices. We're going to talk about that today. This is WWJT. I'm Andrew, joined, of course, by Joel. Back again after COVID. We both got COVID, actually. You're you're still struggling with it, but not too bad, right? Not too bad. Nice to be back. I mean, it's been almost like three weeks for me. So, you know, I'm by all numerical standards should be okay. But I have like a lingering little bit of tickle in my throat. <laughs> so hopefully that sounds fine today. Fair enough. Well, that's that's the extent of the banter on this podcast. Let's, let's jump right <laughs> in. Um, Joel, you actually worked at a company just like Nest. Like Nest is the one that everybody knows about the smart thermostat, but Ecobee is also uh, very similar to Nest. It's like the exact exact same thing. You would say it's better because of course you worked there, um, more accurate or something. Tell, tell us what this technology is. Yeah. So specifically I worked, you know, on smart thermostats in the smart home space um, at Ecobee. And I was there for about four years, two years as an engineer, figuring how to build the products and two years as a product manager, figuring out like, yeah, what do people want us to build next? Um, and it was interesting at Ecobee, the big thing is it was a Toronto tech company competing with Google had acquired Nest. Um, so competing with Google and the marketing dollars that Google has with them. So the question was always like a David and Goliath story where it's like, how do you compete with this person who has far more resources than you, at least by, you know, most uh, conventional perspectives? And and the David and Goliath story is kind of fitting because, as Tony Ranke would argue, David had better technology to defeat the person with more strength and resources, right? The the smoothness of the stone that flies through the air and the ability to to sling it with speed rather than with muscle power. It's not just the weak versus the strong; it's the smart versus the strong. And in that light, should we? Uh, should we think about how our, our technology can be smarter and, and even in our own home? So, so is it just about saving customers money through decreasing the use of our thermo or uh, furnaces during times we're not needing it? Like that's, that's what it does, but how would you think about it as a designer? Yeah, I think, so that's like the big marketing push or, or the call it cloud call it the value propositions, right? It's like, why would someone buy a smart home device? And like, you know, regardless of it's like thermostat or smoke detector or doorbell or, you know, smart lights, all of these devices promise you that it will, you know, help your life, simplify your life um, or add some level of enjoyment that you couldn't do with like the previous you know, not smart or not technology enabled products. Um, so specifically, yeah, with the thermostat, that's a control unit for your utilities that heat and cool your home. Um, so typically the messaging is like, yeah, saving energy, you know, managing that smartly for you. So you don't always have to be thinking like, oh, like I'm going to leave home now. Let me turn it down. Or I'm coming home and anticipate me coming home to turn the thermostat back up. Uh, so when I get home, it's not like super hot. Um, uh, so like those are those are the, the kind of level one um, value propositions. And then like deeper, when we started doing customer research or when I started like talking to people, I would ask friends like, you know, including you or other friends be like, hey, like, you know, what, what do you want in a smart thermostat? Like, what are you looking for? And there kind of became this um, truth, I would say, that came up that's like people want people like across a wide spectrum of different personas. They all want control over their busy and continually getting more busier lives. People want control over the lives and they don't necessarily want control over 
the devices that may be a way to get control over their lives. But if we can kind of optimize that for them to say, Hey, like, you know, we're going to help simplify your life for you. That's really like what people are looking for. Yeah. Similarly. I mean, it's one of the interesting things about tech companies is people think about them as purely value proposition level. But if you sit within their marketing teams or product teams, they're always thinking about the emotional or the under this, the, next layer as you you described it um the same was true at the tech company i worked at like what are the emotions that drive people to want this tech tool it's almost it's almost like that underlying motive and and yeah people want control over their lives we live in a world where people feel like they don't have control over their lives literally in canada we have um the conservative party having candidates who talk about their their foundational principle is giving people control of their lives back you know and taking it away from the government obviously that's like the conservative right wing side of things libertarian perhaps too but but yeah it's it's a promise you can have control of your life buy our product you can have control of your life you don't deliver on that though like ecobe nest it's it's just something else to manage you need to you need to update the app it's all, always bothering you it's trying to do things that you don't want it to because you're homesick one day and it's like super hot in your house it's like dude i need conditioner like i need air conditioning on right now so it's actually more to manage more to control not less so it's a false promise yeah well actually so <clears throat> i wouldn't say it's a false promise outright but like all technology or a lot of technology companies, kind of the, the goal and mission is like quite um, broad and impactful, you know, where every tech company is like, we're going to change the world. Like that's like <laughs> their goal. Uh, and then you know, it's like, oh, change the world. How? And I think um, the smart home consumer who had like bought devices, they noted what you just said, where it's like, actually, like uh, now I just have more things to manage. So it's like, that was the same group that they had already like bought a few devices and they're like, oh, we have more to manage. So I think like, this is kind of like a wave two of smart home products, where it's like the first wave was like just making devices that could like do things for you. And if you're really smart, you can integrate different devices and, you know, do some smart actions. But now it's like, after people have tried those and got some insights, they're like, oh, this is actually more to manage make it easier. So now it's a question of really like, how do you turbocharge the features by maybe like adding AI to start making decisions and controlling and stuff that you don't have to manage it. And then you get the benefits of the automation and the benefits of, you know, you not having to manage it because there's something else managing it for you. All right. Well, we're going to bring in Alistair Roberts. You remember I talked about him. He he like studies the Bible a whole bunch. Yep. Um, spent a year doing that. So so let's let's see what he has to say about uh, thermostats. There are a few categories that might be of help here. We might think, for instance, of the way in which technologies can transform the ecology of our society. One of the great commentators upon technology and theorists of technology, Neil Postman, talked about this ecological effect of technology, that technology isn't just adding something or subtracting something from society. It's changing fundamentally its way of dealing. Ecologists sometimes talk about a trophic cascade. When a new species introduced into an ecosystem or a species removed from an ecosystem, produces a situation where everything within that ecosystem changes, all the way down the food chain. The introduction of wolves into Yellowstone Park, for instance, changed the ways in which the rivers flowed through the influence upon the behavior of deer. There are many unpredictable effects that technologies can have that are similar to this. When you introduce a technology into a society, it's very hard to predict how it's going to play out. One of the things that technology does, for instance, is decondense things that were once held together. There are certain realities in our lives that hold together many different things. So, for instance, think about the hearth and what the hearth traditionally provided. The hearth was a place where you prepare your food. It was a place. Okay, so I did not know what a hearth a hearth was when he was first doing this, and then the picture is helpful. It's like it's a wood stove that you can cook with. It's a fireplace in your home, all right? Place where you sort heat, 
where you gathered together around the fire on a cold winter night. Whereas in the modern house, we all have central heating and we have heat within our own private rooms and can go off into our different corners of the house and enjoy that. Within the traditional house, people would have to gather around these sources and sites of heat, particularly the hearth. It would be a place where cooking was done, where food was prepared. It would be something that required daily chores on the heart part of the family. Every single member of the family would have their own role to play. Maybe the father and the oldest sons would be cutting and getting the wood. Then some of the younger sons maybe bring in the wood from the from the wood pile for the fire. Then the fire would have to be lit early in the morning. The wife, perhaps, and her daughters would be preparing food there. And all these different roles gathered around the hearth. When we talk about the hearth, the hearth, because of its importance within the traditional household, has a symbolic purpose as well. We talk about hearth and home. The hearth is the fire, the life that exists at the very heart of the home. It's a symbol of the life of the gathering of the family. It's that which lies in the very heart. Whereas now, for many of us, the heart of the house is found in the television screen. It's the place where people gather to see the bright light and to enjoy fellowship with each other, but a very mediated fellowship. The hearth is a central site around which the family finds its life being formed. It's a place for telling of stories. It's a place for practicing of things in community and sharing of communality. It's a place where you recognize that you belong to each other. The hearth provided heat, and now we have new technologies to provide heat. Many of the things that the hearth provided in addition to providing heat are lost. They're separated from the thing that once held them with other things. And so what we have is central heating and people no longer gathering together to share stories in the cold. That loss is a significant loss. So he goes on to talk about the different aspects of life and how technology separates them, um, disentangles them. So you have heating done in one thing, cooking done in another, and everything's optimized for a single purpose instead of having those overlapping functions that serve this these goods that you don't realize. Like the daily chores actually provide an opportunity to love your family in this real physical way. Like my my in-laws use a wood stove. They don't cook with it, but the wood stove functions for them where there needs to be wood split. That's a job that some people are more skilled at and are valued because of that um, and appreciated because of that. And so they need to split that wood. They need to gather it, bring it into the house. They need to use their strength. And then there is this task then of making sure in the winter nights that it's filled. And yeah, it is colder in the bedrooms, but then you have someone who gets up in the middle of the night and puts on a couple extra logs and, you know, it's, it's more work, but then it's, you're, it's more, it's, there's more family in it. There's more appreciation. There's more embedded community. And when you take away these functions out of a home and technology optimizes it, then you start to lose things that you never realize you'd miss. And that's my fear. I don't know the difference between a thermostat and a smart. So thermostat is really that different, if I'm honest, because it's just the ease of changing the thermostat from your smartphone, the ease of, and and the tracking of it. Um, but when I think about smart devices more broadly, and I think about, you know, the things that happen by an AI in my own home, I worry about how that introduces this new character in my home that is not someone that I want my kids to grow up to be like. Right. Yeah, no. So I think, I mean, it's interesting. There's like a, a definite recurring trend I'm starting to see, not just in smart home, but like all technologies of like, hey, there's this new technology. It has this promise, but they're like, it's not really clear what the necessary impacts of it are on our society. Um, and, you know, like you, you did mention like, okay, there's already a thermostat. We've already kind of moved away from this hearth to like distributed heating, um, at least in like many places of the world. Um, but what the smart thermostat does is it actually like there's always like, yeah, like risks that maybe weren't originally seen. 
So now these devices are cloud connected and it actually becomes a national interest because you could have like a state sponsored attack where if they were able to kind of connect all your, you know, electrical devices, they could do two things. They could either like increase the demand, creating a brownout because your, you know, electricity generation generators at like power plants couldn't meet everyone turning up the thermostat um, and all the HVAC turning on at once or like, you know, like shutting it off and like people not having access to energy or heating and cooling. Right. And the devastation that would have. So, you know, there's that's scary, like, man. Yeah. It, I mean, it, and that's it, a real threat because like, there's no perfect security system. Like if you work hard enough, if you have enough resources, you can hack things. Like even the Russian government has been hacked by, you know, Ukrainian software developers and people who are supporting Ukraine. Like it's it's possible to hack so many systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is definitely like, I mean, the company I'm working at now, actually like one of their main focuses is like security and getting data to security so you can like better manage it. But it's like what companies do now is they have like a, a team of kind of like frontline resources who are monitoring for attacks and threats and like making sure everything's good. And it's actually just a continuous battle. It's like the threat actors and the defenders are just continually like trying to compete and improve their systems. And that's like, that's like security. And I think like, you know, the analogy did happen in the old days. It's just like the power now is, is more consolidated, which is an interesting point kind of to the video was saying that like, you know, everyone is using this like one heating source for the home and now it's like fragmented, but actually now it's like the entire country is using one kind of like power generation and demand consumption utility. It can be scary, I think. And that's why maybe a lot of smart home devices are like, you know, offering local only control. So they they don't have cloud control. It's just like, locally when you're in the home or something um you can access it so there's there's definitely ways where you can structure it where you don't have those risks yeah i think there's going to be like i'm i'm in favor of nuclear power but then that means that there's going to be risks with nuclear power plants um you know the for the environmental benefits that outweigh the costs environmentally by far with nuclear power same with smart devices in your home, smart thermostats. The the environmental benefits, I think, are significant um, enough to maybe, you know, buy it if you're just looking at, at that one metric. It's just thinking about, do you want to have this additional burden, um, you know, in, in your home? And it's hard to predict those trade-offs. It's impossible to predict the trade-offs. Yeah, there'll be things that you don't consider. Like even like that, what I mentioned where it's like, the cloud can control, let's say your thermostat. Actually, as a for Ecobee, as a user, you have to opt into some program where what you do is you allow um, utilities, like your utility, to kind of like offset your demand by, let's say, one minute. So instead of a neighborhood, everyone with 10,000 ACs turning on at the same time and then having a spike of energy, they could like put, you know, 3,000 the minute before. 3,000 in the minute and then 3,000 at, you know, the minute after and kind of split into three groups. Um, And then they have this smooth out energy response. And what that actually prevents is that it prevents them from turning on like a backup coal generator Um, and they can stick to kind of the newer clean energy generation, um, which may have like a lower capability for demand. So it's like, you know, that's a, that's a, a benefit now you get from having that level of control um, that we didn't have before. So there's always like these impacts that I think, you know, that we designed the technology for and then impacts that we hadn't considered, right. With social media and everything. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. I've talked to people who work at some of these smart device companies and they're always trying to figure out, really what is the problem we're solving (laughs) because i think it's hard to justify some of this tech because you're just kind of like oh well we could connect your toaster to the internet why you know like is there any need or my fridge 
do I really need my fridge connected to the internet? And then it's like, oh, then when I'm at the grocery store, I can, you know, Skype with my fridge and I can see, (laughs) hey, fridge, what's in there? Oh, we do need milk, you know, instead of having the hassle of going out on another trip. Sure, you know, making a list is so passe and we got to use these Skype fridges now. Like it's just, it gets a little bit, you see these very, very small problems that are being solved at the cost of introducing a complex technology that has risks that are unknown, that has impacts that are unforeseen. And it's just kind of like this, did we need this or are we introducing technology just for the sheer pleasure of introducing tech and being the most modern, cool tech first adopter that we can be? Yeah. Um, I mean, like, but Joel, push back, man. You're, no, you like, are, like, you're an early adopter. So, like, for the fridge example, for, for, you know, this hypothetical product, right? That, like, you know, I've seen videos where, like, promise to tell you, like, when your food is about to spoil, because it can start smelling like different gases that are emitted by spoiling foods and stuff like that. Um, so that's just like a gas sensor, right? But you can also start doing things where it's like you can improve the longevity of these devices because you can start to analyze where failures happen and which equipment in your fridge and start building more efficient fridges that like last and of 10 years, 20 years, or like on a like broader scale, like maybe that like data can be brought back to the manufacturer to be like, Hey, actually like we learned that this technology for refrigeration compression is bad. And now like, instead of building three, 4 million more fridges that are going to fail quickly, we can make that change right away. Um, and save millions of dollars for the corporation, but also like the waste that that's going to have by like people needing to throw out those fridges and stuff like that. So data, we're talking about data. Okay. A while ago, I bought this app that helped me track my sleep. That was a great idea. Then I stopped using it after a while, but because I recently needed to give my daughter medicine at night, I wanted to use it again because then it would wake me up when I'm not in my REM cycle sleep. So it'd be like between one and two in the morning, but then you're out of your REM sleep. It'll wake me up and that'll help me get sleep. But it came with all this other data, like it, and I started using it every night just for a week. And then all of a sudden I was like, I woke up one morning after my son was waking up a bunch of the night and I look and I'm like, oh, I only got four and a half hours of sleep. And I saw that data and I was like, what am I using this app for? This data is so unhelpful. I don't want to know how much sleep I got or how effective my sleep was. This data is is actually doing the opposite of what it's intended to do. What am I supposed to do? Like, I'm waking up to help my son go back to bed because he's sick. Like, that's not his fault. That's not my fault. This is just an unhelpful piece of data that's going to make me feel bad that I didn't get enough sleep when really that's just part of life. And I worry about data and what it does to us. I mean, in that example, obviously there's a negative. Um, One of the things that comes up with in John Dyer's book from the garden to the city is he talks about, you know, how, how data is attractive and, and he brings up the story, um, the story in second Samuel 24, where David um, commands that the people in the armies of Israel be counted. And so there's this census, good survey approach, right? But because God recognized that David was using the census to flatter his own pride and lessen his dependence and trust in God, they take away the census. God like says no more of that. And I remember reading through that and being like, that's kind of weird because what's wrong with doing a census? But sometimes data can have these negative effects that we start to overanalyze ourselves. We start to think things that we shouldn't think. It'd be like weighing yourself three times a day, every day. That's not a healthy thing to do, right? Yeah. And the more data we have about our fridge, our home, all this kind of stuff, like you talked about it being this big data, internet of things play. And it's like, man, do we need all this data? Is it actually that helpful? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Like, so um, to clarify, now I work at Splunk, which is a big data company. And it's kind of like using all these data analytics to drive insights. And I think for like a company, it it is 
like an enterprise company, it is like different where it's like, yeah, if you're measuring, you know, something three times a day of some machine and it's like a negative result, you want to know that you want to be like, okay, how can we improve this process? Because we know any changes we've made so far aren't working. But when it comes to your own like psyche, like measuring three times a day, like you said, like can be unhealthy or like even, you know, another similar analogy could be like, if you took, you know, a DNA test and then you found out that you were susceptible to like some critical illness or that you're going to get some right. critical illness, like, would you want to know, or would you want to live life more carefree? And I think like, you know, depends on the individual, right? Like where they are in terms of like handling information, but I would be the same as you, where if I read like, Hey, I have four and a half hours of sleep, I would think about that and internalize it and be like, Oh, I didn't sleep as much rather than not knowing. Um, but if it came to like knowing if I was like, you know, going to get some cancer, I'd rather know and then like plan for, you know, it. So I think it's, there's no answer here, <laughs> but I think it's an interesting conundrum to think about. Yeah. Like I use a, a web tracker to figure out how much time I'm wasting on the computer. And I get this weekly email and it's like, Hey, you spent this many hours on entertainment this week. Right. And I find that helpful. Like I, I want to be reminded of that so that I can, you know, try to make it more obvious. I think it's helpful to find out on your phone, you know, Apple built in the weekly report there too, of like, here's how much time you're using your screen. And sometimes we don't realize it, how much technology is overwhelming us. I, I just, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's good to get data. I think it's good for data to help make decisions, but there's, there's these trade-offs. And I think the smart home is the allure of having more technology to better able to make, being better able to make decisions. And sure, it, it might help in some ways, but I think your, your distinction between a corporate warehouse and the home is a, is an interesting one because do we want our home to be all about efficiency or all about effectiveness? Do we want our home to embody more love or more, you know, productivity? Because productivity and love do not mean the same thing. In fact, it, it would be quite ridiculous to say to my wife, how are my metrics? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Here's here's our weekly report. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that um, you're down three points uh, in regard to uh, tender love and care, and uh, just wanted to say that your your affirmations of me have uh, deteriorated over the last six months by uh, five percentage points. So, uh, just wanted you to work on that, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll meet again next week. Sound good? Like that's ridiculous. It is. It is. I mean, okay. And this is kind of like going to be an interesting perspective, but like at first I was like, yeah, that sounds horrible. And then I was like, oh, but now at least it's like quantified how bad I'm doing. Not just like you're doing bad, but, <clears throat> but you can't, you can't quantify love. That's my point that yeah. there might be some aspects of some specific behaviors. Right. But even then those behaviors, if not tied back to what love really is looking at like a passage like first Corinthians 13 or something, you know, it's patient kind. Um, I remember once speaking about that uh, at your wedding, I think <laughs> um, how long ago was that anyways? So you like love is not defined. It love cannot be defined uh, by metrics. There might be metrics that relate to it, but it can't be defined. You can't define your love of God by how many devotions you have. Yeah. No, I totally um, agree. Right. And the same is within your home and how you love your kids and, and that sort of thing. So I think I think smart homes could drive more data and insights, but there are some things that are very difficult to measure and you know, self-report measures. Like I'm at a church now, we're trying to do like yearly surveys, maybe about like, have you grown closer to God? And it's like, well, 75% of people say they grew closer to God. Did they, <laughs> or did they just say they did? Right. Um, anyways, it's, I find that stuff interesting, but then I could care more about the debt data than the actual people 
that yeah, no, totally. may or may not be growing. Yeah, no, there's an interesting insight you also mentioned about like, and I think it gave me more clarity on the smart home really, where it's like, what has been happening, I would say more recently is like, people are getting all this data about their home and the winter and cooling cycles, but they're actually getting overwhelmed, right? Where they're like, okay, there's like all this data, but like, I don't really know what to do with it. Or like, you know, maybe it takes a lot of effort to like, properly contextualize it and dig into it and understand that like oh there is like this really cold snap and like that's why your furnace is running extra long that day so you have to like now overlay that with weather i think yeah like what might come in the future right if you think about like the smart home in the future i do really think like i don't know anyone who has uh, a butler or like a steward i think that still is like an elite class people hire cleaning services people hire like an individual or a team to come into their house and clean it they hire nannies and they hire daycare providers and things like that right right yeah it's not necessarily one person managing your home but you kind of like outsource parts of it but i feel like that that future can still come but it also needs to come with like again it has to stitch together with AI to make those inferences and understand the data. So you don't have to, so you're not getting inundated with all this data. You're just coming home and being like, you know, pleased with the home being like, so I don't know, enjoyable for you. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I want to live in a house that's like that. (laughs) Yeah. Like, you know, the Roomba replacing, let's say cleaning services, but it, it turns into, Elon Musk, Optimus Prime robot, so it can actually like do a proper cleaning, and you come home and the house is clean. Yeah, like I hear you um, on on the benefits of it, but there's still a part of me that wants to differentiate between that. I mean, it's always interesting, right? Doing the dishes versus using a dishwasher. If you are forced to do them by hand and then you're doing them with someone else and you're drying the dishes or whatever, there's, there's that physical action and the, and the shared community, like there is something different to it. Obviously it's simpler, but what are you using your time um, doing? Right. Like with everything so optimized, then all of a sudden we sit down as a family, get our food fed to us, get our dishes cleared for us, get everything done for us. But then we're no longer forming, we're no longer doing something together. Like in the book of Hey Guy, he's like, hey guys, <laughs> hey guy says, hey guy. Um, <laughs> um, kill me. And he tells the people, rebuild the temple and they all do it together. They all do it together and they have this job. They have to work together. And you don't hear much in the Old Testament about loneliness. You don't hear hear much of the people of Israel um, about there being this. I mean, there's lack of unity, but it always is is within groups. There's there's always this community that exists, mm-hmm. and they had to do a lot of stuff together. The center of the home now is is not a fireplace or a hearth or hearth. Um, nor is it a TV. It's probably each of our individual phones pulling us apart optimized for our own personal enjoyment and when everything's optimized then we're not doing anything together we're looking at our own phone that can give us our sports page that we want to read um rather than yeah no, what no, our I brother think, wants to yeah i think that's a good not necessarily conclusion but kind of observation that like you know we instead of like dishwashing to de- gather together washing and drying now like that community time you're what are you doing with it And if what you're doing with it is just like sitting on the couch, watching TV, then giving you that time back was actually, you know, a detriment to your life. But if you're using that time to, you know, I don't know, build um, a dog shed with your son or something, it's like, we've now like enabled you to have that like benefit where previously maybe your son, he just had to like play by himself. Right. So I think like, Again, it's like technology changes things, but the question is like, how is it changing things? You know, it could be positive, it could be negative. And how do we make more people choose positive paths? I don't know. I, I think we need 
my wife and I have talked about this a bunch, how sometimes you grow the best friendships by doing something together. Even me and you, our friendship has grown more by doing this podcast together. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the increased interaction because I enjoy talking with you. Um, but if we didn't have something to do and to accomplish, then it, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't use, we wouldn't find time to do, to have the conversations that we're having in order to encourage each other in the ways that we're trying to. So uh, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I, I just worry of this highly optimized household, which we pretty much already live in. It's incredibly optimized. Um, but then, you know, sometimes I have my best best thoughts as I'm preparing a sermon or something when I'm washing dishes because I'm not doing anything else. It's distraction free other than the podcast I'm listening to or something like that. <laughs> it's it's like we go from our optimized things to other optimized things. And yeah, they're optimized for the benefit of the companies, not the benefit of ourselves. And I just I just worry about the increase in influence of them on our lives. But I also use them and adopt them. I have a smart device in my home right now. So that, that um, downtime, I think is an important point where it's like, you're moving from very busy moment to very busy moment where it's like some of these more, let's say mundane tasks actually give you some time to like pause and reflect. So like as an impact to us, when we take away those opportunities, we may not have enough downtime to reflect and like that will have, um, you know, a negative consequence, but like, you know, conversely, let's think about like, you know, the smart home of the future where you do have like these robotic hands or like a robot who's actually like cooking for you instead of having to like, think about like what groceries do I need to get? How do I cook? Whatever. You might have that moment to sit down and read a book before your dinner. Um, so it could create downtime. So I think like, yeah, I think it's it's more complicated than kind of always assuming that it's going to give kind of negative repercussions. Um, it's just like it can have positive or negative. I really it depends kind of on the individual. But I don't think that we are empowering people to deal with these like technology changes effectively. I think people kind of just get hit by them or adopt them without kind of like knowing the the trade-offs well joel that's the whole point of our podcast right um to really help people think about these trade-offs final thoughts on smart homes joel do you think jesus if he lived in our society would he use smart homes oh that i was not i did not prep for that question which obviously i should because that is our you know <laughs> key question <laughs> but you can punt it it's not an easy question to answer I just don't want to say something about Jesus and then be mis- mischaracterizing him. But I don't know, like, did he have people, you know, serve him in his ministry? Yes. And did he view that as valuable so he could kind of like carry out what he was brought here to do? So I think like my, my you know, pro technology, pro smart home statement would be to say that like he would say yes to having something like, you know, Mary pour perfume on him and like wash his legs um, or someone like bring him the, the bread and fish that he could then do something with it. So I think the smart home would be something he c- could, would use. I know it's a stretch here. What do you think? What are your thoughts, Andrew? I think Jesus was very good at loving his neighbor and not turning his neighbor into someone who is either useful or not, but to love them. And so I don't think in our day, well, Jesus really, when he lived, he was pretty focused on preaching to a bunch of different people in different areas, healing in different areas, and then going to a cross and dying. And so, and then rising again, of course. And so it's, it's almost the, the question of our show is a question that I don't think is that fair in a way, because Jesus had a job to do and, and he did that job in a particular time and place. And so 
the the real question that I think our our show is asking is what should Christians use for technology? Um, I don't know if Jesus would use smart tech or not. I know that he he seemed to use the the tech of the day, right? He used yeah. sandals. He used the clothes. He used money. Um, he used money. And as a carpenter for say twenty or more years of his life, in all likelihood, he was a carpenter. He would have been using tools. We don't know of any revolutionary approach that he had. You know, I'm not going to use a hammer because it builds my strength to use just my heart, my arms. You know, like he was using the tools of the day for that. And surely he was using, you know, carpentry tools to make his life easier and to make his job easier. So it's it's not like he he lived a radical way. You know, I'm thinking back to our our a couple previous podcasts, the one on the metaverse where we talked about like, you kind of live in the time that you're living in. You don't try to live in a time prior. So if yeah. everybody's using a thermostat, I, I'd be shocked if Jesus came into somebody's house and said, what are you using a thermostat for? He'd be more right. care. He'd care more about the person than the technology. Right. right. But should Christians use technology? Yes. Should Christians use smart homes? Eh, maybe, maybe wait a little bit and <laughs> see whether they're worth it. it. Yeah, I think intentional. Being intentional. Yeah, like being mindful is definitely a theme. Like, and what are your motives? And what are your motives? Like, are you really doing it for care of the environment, for better stewardship of the Earth's resources? You know, when it comes to a thermostat, um, have you calculated the cost versus the benefit, or is it just the shiny thing? Do you just want the data because? you'll have more data. You don't know what insights it'll give you. You just you just kind of want the data. You think it'd be cool to have more data on yourself. Like, um, yeah, this has been WWJT, uh, meandering set of thoughts on smart homes with Joel Jacob and Andrew Noble. I'm Andrew. I'm Joel. And uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Take care. Bye-bye.